Part 2, Chapter 13 No sooner was Rodolphe at home than he sat down quickly at his bureau under the stag's head that hung as a trophy on the wall. But when he had the pen between his fingers, he could think of nothing, so that, resting on his elbows, he began to reflect. Emma seemed to him to have receded into a far-off past, as if the resolution he had taken had suddenly placed a distance between them. To get back something of her, he fetched from the cupboard at the bedside an old ream biscuit box in which he usually kept his letters from women, and from it came an odour of dry dust and withered roses. First he saw a handkerchief with pale little spots. It was a handkerchief of hers. Once when they were walking her nose had bled. He had forgotten it. Near it, chipped at all the corners, was a miniature given him by Emma. Her toilette seemed to him pretentious and her languishing look in the worst possible taste. Then, from looking at this image and recalling the memory of its original, Emma's features little by little grew confused in his remembrance, as if the living and the painted face, rubbing one against the other, had effaced each other. Finally, he read some of her letters. They were full of explanations relating to their journey, short, technical and urgent, like business notes. He wanted to see the long ones again, those of old times. In order to find them at the bottom of the box, Rodolphe disturbed all the others, and mechanically began rummaging amidst this mess of papers and things, finding pell-mell bouquet, garters, a black mask, pins and hair. Hair, dark and fair, some even catching in the hinges of the box, broke when it was opened. Thus dallying with his souvenirs, he examined the writing and the style of the letters as varied as their orthography. They were tender or jovial, facetious, melancholy. There were some that asked for love, others that asked for money. A word recalled faces to him, certain gestures, the sound of a voice. Sometimes, however, he remembered nothing at all. In fact, these women, rushing at once into his thoughts, cramped each other and lessened as reduced to a uniform level of love that equalised them all. So, taking handfuls of the mixed-up letters, he amused himself for some moments with letting them fall in cascade from his right into his left hand. At last, bored and weary, Rodolphe took back the box to the cupboard, saying to himself, What a lot of rubbish! Which summed up his opinion, for pleasures like schoolboys in a school courtyard had so trampled upon his heart that no green thing grew there, and that which passed through it, more heedless than children, did not even, like them, leave a name carved upon the wall. Come, he said, let's begin. He wrote, Courage, Emma, courage, I would not bring misery into your life. After all, that's true, thought Rodolphe. I am acting in her interest. I am honest. Have you carefully weighed your resolution? Do you know to what abyss I was dragging you, poor angel? No, you do not, do you? You are coming confident and fearless, believing in happiness in the future. Ah, unhappy that we are, insensate. Rodolphe stopped there to think of some good excuse. If I told her all my fortune is lost. No, besides, that would stop nothing. It would all have to be begun over again later on, as if one could make women like that listen to reason. He reflected, then went on. I shall not forget you. Oh, believe it. I shall ever have a profound devotion for you. But some day, sooner or later, this ardour, such as the fate of human things, would have grown less, no doubt. Lassitude would have come to us, and who knows if I should not even have had the atrocious pain of witnessing your remorse, or sharing it myself, since I should have been its cause. The mere idea of the grief that would come to you tortures me, Emma. Forget me. Why did I ever know you? Why were you so beautiful? Is it my fault? Oh, my God, no, no. Accuse only fate. That's a word that always tells, he said to himself. 
Ah, if you had been one of those frivolous women that one sees, certainly I might, through egotism, have tried an experiment, in that case without danger for you. But that delicious exultation at once your charm and your torment has prevented you from understanding, adorable woman that you are, the falseness of our future position. Nor had I reflected upon this at first, and I rested in the shade of that ideal happiness as beneath that of the manchineel tree, without foreseeing the consequences. Perhaps you'll think I'm giving it up from avarice. Ah well, so much the worse. It must be stopped. The world is cruel, Emma. Wherever we might have gone, it would have persecuted us. You would have had to put up with indiscreet questions, calumny, contempt, insult perhaps. Insult to you. Oh, and I who would place you on a throne, I who bear with me your memory as a talisman. For I am going to punish myself by exile for all the ill I have done you. I am going away. Whither I know not. I am mad. Adieu. Be good. Always preserve the memory of the unfortunate who has lost you. Teach my name to your child. Let her repeat it in her prayers. The wicks of the candles flickered. Rodolphe got up to shut the window, and when he had sat down again, I think it's all right. Ah, and this for fear she should come and hunt me up. I shall be far away when you read these sad lines, for I have wished to flee as quickly as possible to shun the temptation of seeing you again. No weakness. I shall return, and perhaps later on we shall talk together very coldly of our old love. Adieu. And there was a last adieu divided into two words. Adieu which he thought in very excellent taste. Now, how am I to sign, he said to himself. Yours devotedly? No. Your friend? Yes, that's it. Your friend? He reread his letter. He considered it very good. Poor little woman, he thought with emotion. She'll think me harder than a rock. There ought to have been some tears on this, but I can't cry. It isn't my fault. Then, having emptied some water into a glass, Rodolphe dipped his finger into it and let a big drop fall on the paper that made a pale stain on the ink. Then, looking for a seal, he came upon the one Amor nel cor. That doesn't at all fit in with the circumstances. Pfft, never mind. After which he smoked three pipes and went to bed. The next day, when he was up, at about two o'clock, he had slept late, Rodolphe had a basket of apricots picked. He put his letter at the bottom under some vine leaves, and at once ordered Girard, his ploughman, to take it with care to Madame Bovary. He made use of this means for corresponding with her, sending, according to the season, fruits or game. If she asks after me, he said, will you tell her that I've gone on a journey? You must give the basket to her herself, into her own hands. Get along and take care. Girard put on his new blouse, knotted his handkerchief round the apricots, and walking with great heavy steps in his thick iron-bound galoshes, made his way to Yonville. Madame Bovary, when he got to her house, was arranging a bundle of linen on the kitchen table with Felicite. Here, said the ploughboy, is something for you from the master. She was seized with apprehension and as she sought in her pocket for some coppers, she looked at the peasant with haggard eyes, while he himself looked at her with amazement, not understanding how such a present could so move anyone. At last he went out. Felicite remained. She could bear it no longer. She ran into the sitting-room as if to take the apricots there, overturned the basket, tore away the leaves, found the letter, opened it, and as if some fearful fire were behind her, Emma flew to her room, terrified. Charles was there. She saw him. He spoke to her. She heard nothing, and she went on quickly up the stairs, breathless, distraught, dumb, and ever holding this horrible piece of paper that crackled between her fingers like a plate of sheet iron. On the second floor she stopped before the attic door, which was closed. 
Then she tried to calm herself. She recalled the letter. She must finish it. She did not dare to. And where? How? She would be seen. Ah, oh, no, here, she thought. I should be all right. Emma pushed open the door and went in. The slates threw straight down a heavy heat that gripped her temples, stifled her. She dragged herself to the closed garret window. She drew back the bolt, and the dazzling light burst in with a leap. Opposite, beyond the roofs, stretched the open country till it was lost to sight. Down below, underneath her, the village square was empty. The stones of the pavement glittered. The weathercocks on the houses were motionless. At the corners of the street, from a lower story, rose a kind of humming with strident modulations. It was Binet turning. She leant against the embrasure of the window and re-read the letter with angry sneers. But the more she fixed her attention upon it, the more confused were her ideas. She saw him again, heard him, encircled him with her arms, and throbs of her heart that beat against her breast like blows of a sledgehammer grew faster and faster with uneven intervals. She looked about her with the wish that the earth might crumble into pieces. Why not end it all? What restrained her? She was free. She advanced, looking at the paving stone, saying to herself, Come, come. The luminous ray that came straight up from below drew the weight of her body towards the abyss. It seemed to her that the ground of the oscillating square went up the walls and that the floor dipped on end like a tossing boat. She was right at the edge, almost hanging, surrounded by vast space. The blue of the heavens suffused her. The air was whirling in her hollow head. She had but to yield, to let herself be taken, and the humming of the lathe never ceased like an angry voice calling her. Emma! Emma! cried Charles. She stopped. Wherever are you? Come! The thought that she had just escaped from death almost made her faint with terror. She closed her eyes. Then she shivered at the touch of a hand on her sleeve. It was Felicite. Master is waiting for you, madame. The soup is on the table. And she had to go down to sit at table. She tried to eat. The food choked her. Then she unfolded her napkin as if to examine the darns, and she really thought of applying herself to this work, counting the threads in the linen. Suddenly the remembrance of the letter returned to her. How had she lost it? Where could she find it? But she felt such weariness of spirit that she could not even invent a pretext for leaving the table. Then she became a coward. She was afraid of Charles. He knew all. That was certain. Indeed, he pronounced these words in a strange manner. We're not likely to see Monsieur Rodolphe soon again, it seems. Who told you, she said, shuddering. Who told me, he replied, rather astonished at her abrupt tone. Why, Girard, whom I met just now at the door of the Café Francais, he has gone on a journey, or is to go. She gave a sob. What surprises you in that? He absents himself like that from time to time for a change, and, ma foi, I think he's right, when one has a fortune and is a bachelor. Besides, he has jolly times, has our friend. He's a bit of a rake, Monsieur Langlois told me. He stopped for propriety's sake, because the servant came in. She put back into the basket the apricots scattered on the sideboard. Charles, without noticing his wife's colour, had them brought to him, took one, and bit into it. Ah, perfect, he said, just taste. And he handed her the basket, which she put away from her gently. Do just smell. What an odour, he remarked, passing it under her nose several times. I'm choking, she cried, leaping up. But by an effort of will, the spasm passed. Then, it's nothing, she said, it's nothing. It's nervousness. Sit down and go on eating. For she dreaded lest he should begin questioning her, attending to her, that she should not be left alone. Charles, to obey her, sat down again, and he spat the stones of the apricots into his hands, afterwards putting them on his plate. Suddenly a blue tilbury passed across the square at a rapid trot. Emma uttered a cry and fell back, rigid, to the ground. In fact, Rodolphe, after many reflections, had decided to set out for Rouen. Now, 
as from La Huchette to Bouchy, there is no other way than by Yonville he had to go through the village, and Emma had recognised him by the rays of the lanterns, which like lightning flashed through the twilight. The chemist, at the tumult which broke out in the house, ran thither. The table with all the plates was upset, sauce, meat, knives, the salt and cruet stand were thrown over the room, Charles was calling for help, Berta, scared, was crying, and Felicite, whose hands trembled, was unlacing her mistress, whose whole body shivered convulsively. "'I'll run to my laboratory for some aromatic vinegar,' said the druggist. Then, as she opened her eyes on smelling the bottle, "'I was sure of it,' he remarked. "'That would wake any dead person for you.' "'Speak to us,' said Charles. "'Collect yourself. It is your Charles who loves you. Do you know me?' See, here is your little girl. I'll kiss her. The child stretched out her arms to her mother to cling to her neck. But turning away her head, Emma said in a broken voice, No, no, no one. She fainted again. They carried her to her bed. She lay there stretched at full length, her lips apart, her eyelids closed, her hands open, motionless and white as a waxen image. Two streams of tears flowed from her eyes and fell slowly upon the pillow. Charles, standing up, was at the back of the alcove, and the chemist near him maintained that meditative silence that is becoming on the serious occasions of life. "'Do not be uneasy,' he said, touching his elbow. "'I think the paroxysm has passed.' "'Yes, she is resting a little now,' answered Charles, watching her sleep. "'Poor girl, poor girl.' She had gone off now. Then Omay asked how the accident had come about. Charles answered that she had been taken ill suddenly while she was eating some apricots. Extraordinary, continued the chemist, but it might be that the apricots had brought on the syncope. Some natures are so sensitive to certain smells, and it would even be a very fine question to study, both in its pathological and physiological relation. The priests know the importance of it, they who have introduced aromatics into all their ceremonies. It is to stupefy the senses and to bring on ecstasies, a thing, moreover, very easy in persons of the weaker sex who are more delicate than the other. Some are cited who faint at the smell of burnt hartshorn, of new bread. Take care, you'll wake her, said Bovary in a low voice. And not only, the druggist went on, are human beings subject to such anomalies, but animals also. Thus, you are not ignorant of the singularly aphrodisiac effect produced by the Napita cataria, vulgarly called cat mint, on the feline race. And on the other hand, to quote an example whose authenticity I can answer for, Bridau, one of my old comrades at present established in the Rue Malpalu, possessed a dog that falls into convulsions as soon as you hold out a snuff-box to him. He often even makes the experiment before his friends at his summer house at Guillaume Wood. Would anyone believe that a simple sternutation could produce such ravages on a quadrupedal organism? It is extremely curious, is it not? Yes, said Charles, who was not listening to him. This shows us, went on the other, smiling with benign self-sufficiency, the innumerable irregularities of the nervous system. With regard to Madame, she has always seemed to me, I confess, very susceptible. And so I should by no means recommend to you, my dear friend, any of those so-called remedies that, under the pretense of attacking the symptoms, attack the constitution. No, no useless physicking. Diet, that is all. Sedatives, emollients, dulcification. Then don't you think that perhaps her imagination should be worked upon? In what way? How? said Bovary. Ah, that is it. Such is indeed the question. That is the question, as I lately read in a newspaper. But Emma, awaking, cried out, The letter! The letter! They thought she was delirious, and she was by midnight. Brain fever had set in. For forty-three days Charles did not leave her. He gave up all his patience. He no longer went to bed. He was constantly feeling her pulse, putting on synapisms and cold-water compressors. He sent Justin as far as Neufchâtel for ice. The ice melted on the way. He sent him back again. He called Monsieur Canivet into consultation. 
He sent for Dr. La Riviere, his old master from Rouen. He was in despair. What alarmed him most was Emma's prostration, for she did not speak, did not listen, did not even seem to suffer, as if her body and soul were both resting together after all their troubles. About the middle of October she could sit up in bed, supported by pillows. Charles wept when he saw her eat her first bread and jelly. Her strength returned to her. She got up for a few hours of an afternoon, and one day, when she felt better, he tried to take her, leaning on his arm, for a walk round the garden. The sand of the path was disappearing beneath the dead leaves. She walked slowly, dragging along her slippers and leaning against Charles's shoulder. She smiled all the time. They went thus to the bottom of the garden near the terrace. She drew herself up slowly, shading her eyes with her hand to look. She looked far off, as far as she could, but on the horizon were only great bonfires of grass smoking on the hills. You will tie yourself, my darling, said Bovary, and pushing her gently to make her go into the arbour. Sit down on this seat, you'll be comfortable. Oh, no, not there, she said in a faltering voice. She was seized with giddiness, and from that evening her illness recommenced with a more uncertain character, it is true, and more complex symptoms. Now she suffered in her heart, then in her chest, the head, the limbs. She had vomitings, in which Charles thought he saw the first signs of cancer. And besides this, the poor fellow was worried about money matters. End of part two, chapter thirteen.